do that and that. It still doesn't take it over. <laughs> Good enough. Uh, my clock says straight up. So I think we should roll. You guys up for that? Any objections? Anyone think no we're waiting for in particular? I can't see everyone's face directly. See if the folks are looking for. There was a late shift in the agenda, uh, but we'll get to that in just a bit. Note well, you've all read, understand, agree. Look at those nods. Is this post lunch? It is. It's nap time. That's what I figured. Nap slot's always fun. So time to uh, throw rocks at the agenda. I moved uh, Pierre's to the top because he's got a conflict with HomeNet. And actually, uh, I started thinking, how do we do that? Have we not put that on our, uh, our conflict list? But we'll add it next time. I think it's because we had to get the agenda together before you even submit it. So you came after the agenda was already established. So that's, that's like a process breakdown, but that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll put that in the, the list next time. Um, anything else on the agenda missing, incorrect, offensive, compelling? There we are. All right. Come on up. You are, you have to be at that mic. And you have to stand inside the pink square. That way the targeting system always has you in sight. Okay. Can I, can I take it or? You have to stand in the square. Yeah. That's all I know. If you want to dance with the mic, you can, but you have to dance inside yeah, the square. I prefer this way. So, yeah, thank you for letting me present in first time. Sorry for the agenda change. Why did it do that? You know what? All right, who's the PowerPoint wizard here that can help me out? Why does it do this? It oh, it's working for you. I just have it. Oh, okay, perfect. So, so, all right, go ahead. I'm not sure. We should start with the open issues. Thank you. How about we start with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm Pierre Pfister, and I'm here to present you a brand new draft called the Ingress Multicast Flow Overlay using Multicast Listener Discovery Protocols. Next slide, please. So coming from the beer architecture, we have this very fancy slicing of the beer stack. Uh, on the bottom, we have the routing uh, underlay that we know that does the beer very clever uh, forwarding. Um, on top of that, we have the beer layer that is actually supposed to insert and remove the beer um, bits inside the packets. And, and on top of that, we have this multicast flow overlay that is supposed to tell the beer layer what is the beer, what are the beer bits that should actually be included in packets that enter a beer domain such that it can reach the right egress route, uh, routers when moving through the, the beer domain. So regarding that, we, we have a few proposals and lots of things are going on. For the underlay, we already have uh, MPLS adopted documents. For the beer layer, we have uh, NISIS extensions, OSPF extensions. But right now, right now for the multicast flow overlay, it's still a little bit, I mean, still open to, to some work. And right now, we can't really implement a full stack of beer working. Uh, with only our drafts. So that's where this proposal comes. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, this proposal doesn't intend to be the only solution ever as a flow, uh, flow overlay for beer. Uh, let's not try to boil the ocean. Um, the scope of this uh, architecture, in my mind, in this proposal is for small to average, average size network, maybe bigger, I don't know. I mean, I can't guess the scalability of the proposal. Uh, and it's a distributed proposal. It's a distributed um, design. Maybe some people will want more centralized uh, approaches such that they can have more control on uh, what is going on. So it's perfectly fair, and I think it's in scope of the working group to have multiple solutions. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'm going to take the, the mic, but I just got a question if you don't mind asking. I like to we question along the way, so we're fresh in our head. Um, uh, initially, I was going to ask, was there a target scale? But I don't think we even go there yet. Do you have a use case that we can consider to see how this fits in scale? Well, I'm a HomeNet guy. I come from HomeNet. I imagine this very simple scheme could be applied to HomeNet. It's not on today's agenda. It's not, I mean, it's only in mind. I'm happy to contribute to beer without even thinking about HomeNet. I mean, okay. I think this could be a solution in general, but I think beer is really 
the interesting here is that it is its simplicity. And I think we should have one multicast flow overlay which is as simple as here. And really, uh, that's the idea of using MLD because we have implementations of MLD everywhere and that's, I mean, the point is to provide something simple. That's a different simplistic metric just to help you think through the process. They're simple in the machinery is simple and they're simple as it's already implemented, I don't need to do anything else, right? We, with MLD implementation, I think we have almost nothing to do. I mean, You're right, so it's, it's simple to implement, it's already there. We just yeah, apply it in this almost case. There. All right. Uh, next Thanks. slide, please. So I guess everyone in the room knows how MLD works. Obviously, it's based on the ability of nodes on the LAN to be able to send MLD packets to the queries and from the queries to be able to send uh, those uh, queries to the listeners and the queries. Uh, in that process, we have an election that is taking place which elects among the queries one elected query which is actually sending the queries. No, the proposal of this draft is very, very simple. Next slide, please. We do exactly the same process, but assuming that the beer multicast domain also allows us, allows listeners to send multicast packets to multiple destinations. So we consider the beer multicast domain as a LAN, and in on, using this, you have the BMLD queries. We are actually the ingress routers, so they are receiving the traffic. They want to, to know to which uh, egress router they should send this traffic. And in order to do so, we ask the e egress routers to act as BMLD listeners. Um, and the, the process is exactly the same. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to do so, we need almost no changes to MLD at all. Uh, we need some configuration parameters. We need one multicast address, which is used to send uh, those MLD packets. I mean, every time I say MLD, it's IGMP, it's the same. I mean, it's uh, it's for both uh, cases, IPv4, IPv6, IGMP, MLD. Um, so we need the, the um, listeners to send multicast packet to the queries. To do so, we need a multicast address. We also need a multicast address to let the queries send multicast packets to both listeners and queries. Again, across the beer domain. Um, and we also need, in order to be able to send this multicast packet, we need the BFR IDs of the queries and the listeners. Um, then we configure the beer layer with such information. And this information is used by the queries and the listeners to send multicast packet across the beer domain to the, the right um, destinations. Next slide, please. So this is exactly what needs to be changed to MLD in this single slide. Uh, slide. When you send a query, you are going to put as the destination of the query the multicast address which has been configured such that the packet is received by all the listeners and the queries. When you send a report, it's the same thing, but you put a different destination address. As a source address, uh, it changes from MLD because in MLD you only use the link local address. In that case, you are going to put your uh, BFR prefix address, which you already have because you are an egress or an ingress router. So the beer layer is configured with such an address. And you use that address as the source address of your MLD or IGMP packet, um, such that when the destination reaches, the, uh, the, the destination, the multiple destinations receive the report or the query, they can know where it, com it uh, comes from. Uh, we don't need the hop by hop alert option because it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not useful anymore because we use one single multicast address. And um, finally, we have to enable the feature of IGMP v3 and MLDV2, which is the um, explicit tracking, such that you can associate with every uh, BFR prefix address the membership. So next slide, please. So the first mapping is the mapping on the left. You have using MLD, you map the membership with the BFR prefix. Then you need the mapping that actually beer provides you, the mapping between BFR prefix and the BFR ID. And using this both mapping, you can obtain the mapping that is used by the beer layer in order to know where to send multicast traffic to when a packet enters the, the domain. Uh, one final thing that I didn't say is that uh, we, I, I'm proposing that we don't try even to support 
um, MLD V1 or IGMP V2 because, I mean, it's a completely new space. We don't need to be backward compatible with anything. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have two open issues right now based on discussions on the mailing list. Uh, one is that you have not which is actually going to forward that to the um, to the destinations through the beer domain. Uh, in order to, to do so, I think we could do it with no new messaging requiring the. Um, uh, ingress routers to actually listen to the traffic within this domain, but it's a little bit hacky. I mean, we could make it work. Maybe may not be a perfect solution. So it, it shows us sort of that we need some election mechanism. Yet another one. Yet another mechanism to elect uh, designating de designating something. So maybe that also shows us that we need it to be that's that's possibility. Maybe put that in MLD. Such that we can reuse it, reuse it uh, in other situ in other situations. The second open, open issue happens at the exit of the domain. So the first one was the packet enters. No, at the exit we have a kind of similar problem. How to make sure that the packet is not sent twice throughout the same destination? In my opinion, uh, I think the two problems are the same. Um, and I think actually making sure that the packet is not sent twice to the exit domain is actually the um, the work of the next domain flow overlay. So if we solve the first issue, then we can apply it to the second issue as well. Excuse me, I'd argue that the problems are different. Um, and that we said yet another election mechanism. There's some cases we already have election mechanisms we could potentially use. It's been discussion taking place because these issues came up on the, on the mailing list. And it, I was kind of hope we had some way to brainstorm a bit of that today. And I wish you were here for it, but you got to go. But I think you're right on with the, the downstream domain. We already have election mechanisms there. We can probably hijack in some way. But um, in terms of into the network, like what was put out, if it was you know, BGP, that policy can elect that. We lack that here. So here's a case where we may have to do something different. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the I think into the network and out of the network are two different cases. And the topology out of the network and the topology in the network actually can be different and change the case as well. Okay. And well, that's all for the presentation. So now, if you have questions, questions, comments. All right, good. I was hoping this would be a, a, a talk to actually generate some churn. So. Roberta Maglione Cisco. I just have an high level comment. Uh, as you said, uh, the document is uh, applicable to both MLD and IGMPv3. Uh, for clarity, in my opinion, it would be better to reflect that in the title, just to make clear that it's applicable to both IPv6 and IPv4. I know you come from uh, Omnet that is IPv6 focused, well, but. That's all fine. I promise you we spent like. 20, 30 minutes trying to find the right title. So you will you will see that in the end of the title there is protocols with the S, <laughs> multicast listener protocols with the S. That's the best thing we could find out after 30 minutes of thinking about that. Okay, I, I understand. It's just for people that read the document uh, that uh, it yeah. would be much more clear. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Andrew Dolgan, Alcatraz. Can you go to slide five for a sec? Uh, five, no, four, sorry, I guess. On, on my version, it was different one, so go up. The one that has the, this picture, exactly. Uh, maybe for clarity, if you can explain whether you want to totally replace MLD, uh, or you still have a host connected to MLD, so your BMLD listeners uh, do the, uh, do the trans protocol translation between MLD uh, MLD and BMLD. Uh, if we look at this, and the way I look at it is you extending the beer multicast domain towards the access side, then I would think uh, adding extensions to beer for this lightweight election uh, would be a better way than incorporating an extensions like this into MLD and IGMP because we de facto replacing those. In, the way I read this, um, but that you know that can be that can be, but because if you go like if you look at your previous slide, you have the MLD host, you have hosts that will do the uh, MLD IGMP towards the towards the routers. Now you push this down mm -hmm. and really replace this LAN with the beer. 
you really the question is will your host will will your host and host still run IGMP and we need to translate those messages yes. forward and through the beer and do the beer election or were we talking about no IGMP no MLD at all and everything is beer like I think the, there can be slight differences how in we approach that, in that case the host would be oh I can't, I can't get out after this yeah. but the the, the, <laughs> the host would be down even 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 lower like after the egress routers yeah. So after the US router, you can have other domains running PIM, beer, anyway, uh, even MLD, IGMP. But the, it, yeah, they are just talking the MLD probably, one. Probably not PIM. Probably you would have the IGMP and MLD coming, and we're talking about taking those, moving them into the beer messages, sending to the BM, uh, BMLD queries, uh, run the, some lightweight protocol sent back. That to me would make sense, mm -hmm. and that's probably the way. And that would also answer your question on a slide below. And we kind of touch on this with with ICE, uh, it on one of your last slides. Whether where should we do this war? Should it be extensions? I would argue no. It should be in beer, as a, and not extensions to MLD V2. We will just say how we're gonna treat their messages, and do and do, you know, probably still half of the extension protocols but it may be easier because you don't want to enable MLD or anything close on the anywhere in that beer domain like I don't want to have any of that but, but it would, would be MLD it would be right. just, MLD. you mean just to get election yeah yeah exactly yeah, that, that, would, that would be just silly so that's why mm -hmm. I say I would probably you know borrow as much as we can to say borrow still as much from MLD AGMP get get the common election in here do it clean in beer, keep MLD, IGMP, you know, either either at the at the, some hosts or potentially not even have it at all. You can you can imagine hosts are sending the message right away yeah? at some point. More questions? <coughs> all right, excellent. Thank you. And I'm looking forward for all the discussion on the mailing list. Thanks, Pierre. So we just to kind of wrap up some of these thoughts, I'm sure they're going to keep coming up today. But um, the, the the dual home nature in and out are issues that have been kind of cropped up with this discussion. And I think we need to focus that on the list or either with the design team, because I, I agree completely. Why, why rebuild it? Why have a protocol dependency? You know, that this problem exists, whatever the overlay is. So let's let's find something that works all the way in there. Um, so we'll probably be taking volunteers to jump in and participate in a group to break up those two topologies and focus on a solution. Thank you. Next is ICE. Architecture end cap. Two agenda items in one deck. Impressive. Hello. Yeah, works. So I am ice. Stay in the pink square. Yeah, it's, but it's all right. The square is too small for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna give you an update on the the, the beer architecture and the MPLS uh, documents. Uh, should be quite quick. Now there were a few changes to the MPLS encapsulation documents, as you may have seen. So we moved a few fields around. We added a few new ones, and we gave uh, OEM a few bits uh, to play with. So I don't think nothing really drastic, nothing really that changes the, the architecture in that sense. So, yeah. Uh, and of course, some some clarifications and corrections to the architecture draft. Next slide. Now, first of all, a few uh, modifications or clarifications to what the beer domain is. Right now, we consider the beer domain to be uh, where your beer protocol messages go, uh, your, your updates, and that's basically confined to the IGP flooding scope. So it basically follows your IGP flooding scope. Right, so we made that more, more clear in the document. Also, um, when, you, when you create that flooding scope um, with your uh, routers in the middle, uh, if you go from one BFR to another, it's possible that your IGP path actually leads you to a router which is not BFR capable. Right, because the underlay is really your IGP underlay, so it doesn't really have the information. Well, you know, you know it, that your next node is not BFR capable, but if there's no procedures to go around it, you're sort of stuck. 
right? So you need to know that you know it it, com it, it will use all the, the routers or all the you know in that IGP domain, whether they're not capable or not, right? So you may get stuck. That's and I'll speak about that more later on. Actually. Also regarding subdomain, um, so it's the, the the BFIR that determines which subdomain you're gonna afford the packet in. Right? Now a subdomain is strictly tied to the underlay, to the IGP that you do your lookups in. So you're not allowed to change subdomain in flight, right? So a router cannot change the subdomain because a different subdomain makes it be tied to another IGP instance or another topology. So you cannot guarantee that you have a loop-free topology if you change the subdomain. Okay? So we do not allow you to change the subdomain in flight. Next slide. So also what I said is the, the subdomain is strictly tied to, to the to, to the IGP, right? So normally we just use the IGP that is there for Unicast. Um, if you Unicast points you to a router which is not BFR capable, there are certain procedures you can do. Well, the simple procedure is no, you can do anything. You cannot send a packet, so you're stuck, so you drop the packet. Or you can try to hop over it, right? You can tunnel through it. Um, and we, well, we don't, we don't, we don't really want to do a lot around rerouting around it because if you reround around it, you need another IGP topology we need to do that, right? Or specific SPF calculations to find another path to go around it. We don't really attempt to do that. Okay. So the best thing is to sort of tunnel through it if you, if you can. Yeah. Also, it, it, you may actually hit a router which is BFR capable, but maybe it, it didn't advertise the label for the right subdomain, right, or the right bitstream. Right? Also, for that, we don't really try to reround around it. It's just a misconfiguration, right, and you get stuck. Yeah. Next slide. Also, to make it more clear in the architecture, uh, we define in position and disposition bitstream length. Now, in position is the bitstream length that the Ingress router puts onto the packet. This position length is what you use to forward the packet, right? So all the, the other routers in the path, they will go forward or they... In the architecture, what you defined is that you should be able at least to impose one bit string length on the ingress, but you should be able to forward on two. Now, which two they are, it's, it's up to the implementation, right? But we do like to support two different Bitstream lengths uh, at the same time for migration purposes. Right? So if you want to move from 256 to 512 later on, it's very useful that you can support 512 in your network side by side next to 256. And then on the ingress, you cut over once you determine that your network is capable to forward the packet. Right? So for migration purposes, you like to support two different bitstream lengths at the same time for this position. Next slide. <coughs> now, since we allow different bit string lengths to be used in a network, you know, that also opens up the possibility that you have mis you know, uh, inconsistency in a network, that one router is configured to be 256, another is 512 or 128. Right? Um, now, we, we do have information from the IGP to determine you know, which uh, bit string lengths are supported in your subdomain. Although we can use that to do something, and we actually you know, modified the architecture to indicate that, so you can log an error if you know that a particular bit string length in your subdomain is not what you intended to put on the packet on ingress, right? So you can potentially get stuck at that router if, if you know if the shortest path leads you to that router. Right? But it's also possible that it, that router wasn't configured for 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 beer at all, right? And yet you cannot detect that. Now, so what do you do if you de detect an inconsistency? Well, we think the best thing to do is just log an error message that you know there's a potential inconsistency, but you still want to send a packet, in my opinion, because the packet can still go to places where it needs to go, and it may not even hit that router, which has the different bits and length at all, right? So it's still, you want to do a best effort basis to deliver the packet, even though you, you could see that there's a different bits and length supported in that subdomain. Okay. Yeah, next, next slide. So, that's, so as I said, so if you encounter 
uh, an inconsistency, you can drop the packet, you know, or tunnel through the router using procedures similar to, you know, if the router wasn't configured for uh, BFR at all or for BR at all. So we, we don't really want to do any heroic efforts to reroute around routers that have been misconfigured or misprovisioned, right? Because that would require us to change the IGP, to underlay, do special FPS calculations regarding this. And I think you can just consider it as a misconfiguration, right? If you, and we have experience from that in the past as well, like if you have a PIM router, which is on the shortest path to the source, but that router was not configured for PIM, you don't get there, right? Or if your MPLS interface was not enabled for MPLS, you're stuck, right? So we have a lot of OEM tools in, in, in the works also to, to detect those misconfigurations. So we don't want to do anything really to, to reroute around misconfigurations. I think that was the last slide. Any questions regarding this? No comments on the misconfiguration issue. I thought that was a bigger, hotter topic. Okay. Who's awake? Raise your hand. All right. You did okay. <laughs> Thanks. There we are. Thanks, guys. And see, uh, beer MPPN. Excellent. That's three. Gotcha. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Mahesh, and uh, we presented the MVPN the draft in back in Hawaii. Uh, we had some minor updates and some optimization to explicit tracking mechanism for BGP that we added to the document. So just to recall, uh, there is no tunnel building with beer, but we model beer as uh, a P2MP3 with the ingress as the BFIR and all the ingress nodes as the BFIRs. And uh, like mentioned in the previous presentation as well, that beer carries traffic within only one IGP domain. But MVPN also supports P tunnels that are segmented. So if you want to go use segmented tunnels, you need to have the ABSRs or ABRs support or act as BFIRs. So you could have each tunnel do beer. So um, in BGP, we have the PIMZ, which identifies the tunnel. And we had introduced a new tunnel type for beer. Uh, we modified the PTA to include the subdomain as well as the BFR prefix. And uh, the major change to the PTA is the introduction of new flags for explicit tracking. Next slide, please. So, uh, we have two mechanisms to identify the exact set of nodes that we need to forward the packet to. Uh, one is based on the leaf info required flag that's defined. And uh, the other mechanism that we have added to the draft is using the method that's introduced in explicit tracking using the leaf info required per flow flag. Uh, I'll explain more as we go forward. Next slide, please. Uh, also in the PIMZ is the MPLS upstream label. We've added text to see, see how it would be useful in the segmented case as well. And a unique MPLS label is assigned to each C flow. And this is used by the BFER to, to identify the C flow to which the packet belongs. And this is useful when you're forwarding across segments. Next slide, please. So uh, for explicit tracking, to identify the set of egress fees, there are two choices available. We can use the explicit tracking mechanism that's defined in 6513 and 6514 based on the leaf info required flag. or the new option is to use the explicit tracking mechanism based on the LIRPF flag. Now, what this LIRPF flag does is that traditionally Now, for multiple flows, you'll have multiple SPMZs. What LIRPF da does is reduce the scale of SPMZs. It does by sending only a wildcard SPMZ. The wildcard SPMZ will have the LIRPF flag set. The BFERs on receiving the wildcard SPMZ will respond with one or more leaf ADs 
that correspond to that. So you, it doesn't need an LIR to be set on each Cflow Cflow's S10Z. So you just send one wildcard S10Z, and the BFERs will respond with all this one or more leaf ADs. Right? Now, one restriction to this mechanism is that it cannot be used for segmented tunnels. The reason is that for for segmented tunnels, we may have to forward the packet to the next segment, and to determine the tunnel to which we forward the packet on, we need to know the label, or we need to know the context. And if we are using the explicit tracking mechanism, using the LRPF flag, then we are only sending one wildcard SPMZ, and there is no unique labels for each flow in the network. So you cannot really identify which the outgoing tunnel is. So the restriction currently is that you cannot use it for segmented P tunnels. Next slide, please. So this is pretty much what I explained. Uh, the big advantage of using the LRPF flag is a significant reduction in the SPMZ AD routes needed. You will write, need only one as star star SPMZ AD route. Uh, this also means that you don't need, you don't really need any IPMZs in the network. Uh, using a star star SPMZ similar to a partition model is sufficient for beer. Next slide, please. So um, we also added text to modify encapsulation. Encapsulation of the packet. Type in the AD route that's a match for transmission and to create the beer header. So if it the SPMZ AD has an LIR flag set, the leaf AD routes are the ones which identify the egress keys, and the leaf AD routes have the route key which is identical to the NLRI of the SPMZ AD route. If we use the new mechanism of LIR PF flag, then the leaf AD matching routes are not identical to the NLRI of the SPMZ, they are derived from the NLRI. That is mentioned in section 5.2, but basically how it works is we modify the route distinguisher when we respond to the leaf ADs. So the route distinguisher is derived from the SPMZ and we add some values to the route distinguisher to distinguish the fact that these leaf ADs are in response to the LRPF flag. And you can use that to identify the egress keys that we need to send the packet to. Next slide, please. Again, for decapsulation, when the beer packet reaches the egress PE, using uh, there's a small typo there, the, it should be the top label, the top MPLS label will tell you that you are an egress PE. And uh, then the egress PE does the decapsulation by delivering the BFR prefix and the payload. The top label is the upstream assigned label in the payload. Now, the BFR prefix is the context in which the MPLS or the up, upstream assigned label is interpreted. And the BFR prefix corresponds to the beer ID and the subdomain in the header. Next slide, please. So if we, if you are at the segment boundary and it's an ABR or ASBR, the packet might need to be forwarded on to the next segment. And uh, the choice of next tunnel depends on the label or the Cflow to which the packet belongs. And this is directly achieved by having a unique label assigned, unique upstream assigned label assigned to each Cflow. And note that this can be done only using the LIR explicit tracking mechanism. Um, that's pretty much I had for the updates. I'm open to any questions. Questions? Lively bunch today. This is not that contentious, so that's not that too surprising. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mahesh. Number four, beer extensions. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Xiaohu from Huawei. Uh, this draft about uh, BGP extension for advertising beer specific information. Yes. As have been identified in the bear use case draft, bear can be used in multi-tenant data center networks for efficient delivery of um, bomb traffic. Since BGP has becoming a more uh, and more popular as an underlay routing 
protocol in a lot of data center networks. It makes sense to extend the BGP as a, a alternative bear signaling. The idea is to use a new optional transitive path attribute called a bear attribute, um, which can be attend to a BGP update message to carry bear specific information. <laughs> Um, the beer pass attribute is an um, optional and transitive pass attribute. <clears throat> the value field, the beer attribute, could carry one or more beer POEs as so below. The major change in this reversion is the type code of the POE and the sub POE is now two bytes according to Eric Rosen's suggestion. The benefits of this change is we can benefit from the first come first uh, type code allocation procedure. <laughs> Subdomain ID, BFR ID, and the bitstream length field will be contained directly in the beer TOA. Well, the MPS specific information will be carried in MPS beer encapsulation sub QA, which in turn is carried as a sub QA with the beer QA. Sorry, it's, it's Peter from Cisco. So can you Sorry. go back? It's Peter from Cisco, Peter Pshenak. So. You have this BS link in the uh, in the main TLV. In IGPs, we moved it into the BR encapsulation sub TLV. So, just a comment that it would be good if it's consistent between the IGPs and the BGP. Uh, you mean in your new version of uh, OSPF? So if you if you if you look at the ISIs and OSPF extensions for BR, yeah. the BS length has been moved to the MTLS encapsulation sub TLB. Oh, okay. So what I would suggest is to use it similarly okay. and move it there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Next one. Uh, implementation that support beer attributes must support a policy to enable or disable the creation of the beer attribute and the attachment to specific BGP rocks. Uh, implementation may disable or disable the creation of beer attribute. Potentially, it, unless it configured, a BGP speaker must only attend the locally created their attribute to a BGP update message on which at least one of the BFR prefix is contained in the NLRI field. Next slide. Restrictions on sending and receiving their information. Uh, implementation that support beer attribute must support a per eBGP session policy that indicate whether the attribute is enabled or disabled for you on that session. The beer attribute must not be sent on any eBGP peers for which the session policy is not configured. If a beer attribute is received on a BGP session on which the session policy is not config, the information must be treated as if it's what a recognized non -trans transitive attribute. To prevent the beer attribute from leaking out of the beer domain, each BGP router on the beer domain must support an outbound route announcement policy. Such a policy must be disabled. 
by default. Next slide. Deployment consideration. Assume that the beer domain is an uh, administrative domain which are uh, composed of multiple ASs. Use of a beer domain in other scenario is outside the scope of this document. Since the beer attribute is optional transitive pass attribute, now BFR BP speaker who still advertise received and wrote with beer attribute contained. This is beneficial for the incremental deployment of beer, where BP speaker could tunnel a beer packet to the BFER directly if the BP next hop is a non BFR. A BP speaker is allowed to tunnel a beer packet to the BP next hop if these two BP speakers are not directly connected, such as in the multi hop EBP scenario. Next slide. Okay, that's all. Uh, we would like the working group. Start with questions. More questions? Who's read the draft? It's kind of hard to get a decision from the room, at least. Of course, we don't do that in the room. Who thinks this is an item should be picked up as a working group item? Basically, the people who read it. All right. Yeah. So maybe just to clarify. So this does exactly uh, advertise the, 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 the beer properties as done for the Unicast drafts, right, for ISCS and OSPF. Since our networks that only run BGP, we really like to do the same thing with BGP. So I really like to see this one adopted and move forward. So in light of that information, without having read the draft, what's the sense of the room of adoption? Aye? All right. Please read it. There will be a call to the list for adoption with a two-week window. And uh, it's not just what you don't like about it. It's acceptance. Let's hear what you like. Let's hear what you don't like. Let's get some discussion there. Eighty is going to look to see if there's actually some churn in the list that people have chimed in, right? We're not just looking for no's. So yeses are just as important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we're on five. Torless show. I'll um I'll try to take notes for the questions, but I'm not going to follow along as you do your Torless thing in the pink square. Torless, right. stay in the pink square. Yes, yes. All right. I am staying in the pink square. So powerful. Thanks. All right. So, here to E. Um, update number one. Right. Yeah. So, if you have a lot of beer, you need more path freedom. Being just on the shortest path is not good enough. Next slide. Reminder, what was this about? So in BRTE, the bit positions are not only the leaves that need to receive the traffic, but also adjacencies through which we want to have the tree go. So we basically um, populate um, in the forwarding table of each uh, BRTE node um, only those adjacencies uh, that we want to forward on on that one. And that gives really a very simple forwarding engine, um, no dependency really on the IGP. If we have hop by hop uh, bits being set, uh, we don't need an IGP at all. The only place we're using it is routing adjacencies, and I'm getting to the relationship of <coughs> to other technologies later on. So the real trick, and that's where some of the complexity in BRT comes from, is all the extensions of uh, giving different type of adjacencies uh, to the bit position so that we can uh, actually get away with as few bit positions as uh, possible because there are limited uh, property with maybe 256 being what we would like to target um, without SIs. Next slide. All right, so version number one. Uh, we have a new co-author, Gregory Koshi, I think uh, maybe here. Yes, sir. So thank you very much. 
Um, and yeah, directly going back to the work then uh, with his input. So the zero zero version read a little bit like there is only controllers in the universe and nothing about uh, CLI. So what was really meant to be implied is that, and I think that's also what we're doing in our prototyping, um, the actual configuration of VRTE on the individual devices is through CLI. Whether or not we need to standardize that is an open question. And then basically a, a controller would go through the CLI first. And once we um, basically have enough experience with that, we can think about a Yang model to basically make it more ITF process compliant. And for networks that are mission specific, limited scale, limited size, like I can even see uh, some IPTV deployments, maybe manual configuration would be good enough forever. So um, that's experience to be um, collected through experimentation. So then I got the feedback, uh, the set identifier. What about a set identifier? You didn't mention it. And that just fell over in OO because um, it's not the problem of using it. Um, and the text now says you can use the set identifier in the same way as in here. You basically, per set identifier, you have a different BRT forwarding table with the different semantics of the bits. So pretty much the same thing. The trick is rather how in BRTE to avoid that you need in every set identifier reallocate a bit for intermediate costs. So that's kind of the intelligent logic of trying to figure out, oh, I have um, one set identifier for, let's say, this part of the network. And that's basically where I allocate bits for the intervening hops that I go through. And then I have another set identifier when I'm doing replication into another part of the network. And there is certainly a lot of future text on, you know, possible, you know, tricks uh, on how you do the allocation to be done, but nothing really that in the forwarding plane needs to change. Just one quick comment, I from Cisco. So I think for set identify, what you really need to use is subdomain here. That's you create different subdomains in part of the network, yeah. not set identifier. But it's a small thing, similar concept, but it's. Did I good. get the fields in the header mixed up? And I'm sorry, I'll try to fix that soon. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next slide. Okay, encapsulation. Uh, we didn't say anything about encapsulation at all because um, the, uh, you know, the idea would be it should work in all the encapsulation that here works as well. And so the question is, what is kind of the header information that distinguishes a beer to eat packet from a beer packet? Um, could be in the header itself, could be in the encapsulation. Um, it seems that the most easy starting point uh, is with the MPLS encapsulation. We're using a dedicated label to identify a beer packet, and we would use another um, unique label value to identify a beer to eat packet. And I think um, we would need to check which other encapsulations are relevantly being worked on and uh, figure out what um, uh, distinction for the BRT packet we would want to make with that as well. Um, another uh, unclear thing um, was ECMP, right? Why do we have a separate ECMP mechanism in BRTE over uh, the mechanism in uh, BR? And so it's, it's hard to put in, in, into all the details, but to, to the best of my understanding is I couldn't figure out how to make the um, ECMP in beer work for BRTE because of the way it is tied into the beer with IGP integration. Um, maybe that's just a shortcoming on my side, right? So the idea um, of the ECMP mechanism as it's defined in the BRTE um, draft is that we leverage the entropy in the same way um, to uh, be able to create um, consistent path selection for packets in the flow, having the same entropy. Um, but then be able, uh, by setting up explicit a list of the alternative adjacencies in the TE forwarding table, and being able to do that differently on multiple hops to very explicitly engineer the ECMP choices that are made hop by hop for traffic. Um, and so I think that is going beyond the flexibility that I would have in a beer. But uh, any feedback, any you know review uh, on, on that section, more than welcome because right now that was more a high-level um, question to Mike. Dame. Uh, Greg Mirsky, Erickson. Um, so um, your uh, plan that uh, selection of, with a beer, beer traffic engineering uh, based on uh, beer label will be a local decision, or it will be domain-wide? No, the ECMP decision. No, no, uh, uh, T. 
uh, encapsulation proposal. Yeah, so uh, with a VR label. I was I was just following up with uh, what what I've recommended, ah. and uh, so following exactly the same scheme that is being used for beer packets with MPLS. Maybe you can answer. <clears throat> Yeah, I, th I think what you mean is how to identify uh, TE traffic from normal traffic, and the idea is to associate it with a different beer label. Right, so we allocate a different label and advertise it around potentially. So it's not a globally unique or the domain-wide unique label for traffic engineering, mm -hmm. but we can do the same as we do today for shortest path. You just announce a different label that you announce in the IGP and say this is traffic engineering. Okay. And I think that that creates a de another dependency against the IGP. So I think I need to. Um, yeah, I, I think that part is not specified yet. Right. So yeah. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Well, because we have, you know, much more easily, and we're getting to that in a slide further down, to get across non-beer capable hops. So, and if the label is something we need to send through the IGP, we'll need to figure out um, if we're reducing the incremental adoption options with this approach. Okay. Um, next slide. All right, and, and this is basically really where this gets to. So um, beer to e versus segment routing. So um, segment routing, and I hope I'm politically correct here with this terminology, otherwise come and hit me. So the way I always understand segment routing is a lightweight replacement of RSV PTE. Um, and so then the question is, what would be the you know multicast uh, uh, equivalent for segment routing, which today is the unicast technology, and we actually embarked on trying to find the best answer. And you know, we hope BRTE is the best answer there, um, because in the end, um, the you know fundamental concept on which we uh, are trying to do BRTE is pretty much the same thing that we're saying we want to have the ability to have loose source routed hops, um, meaning trying to figure out what is the minimum number of hops through the network that gives us a the ability to steer the traffic how we would like it uh, and get it replicated, right? And so basically. Logically speaking, in BRTE, you need to assign bit positions to every node through which you just steer the traffic. Like you don't even replicate it, but it has to go through here, not through here, because these are parallel paths. I'm trying to do load splitting, right? Um, or you need to replicate through that. So obviously, replication not being a subject in Unicast, that's a novel part. Um, and so you can see easily how BRTE applies to, you know, let's say specifically IPTV, video contribution network examples which in the past have been very strong on uh, suggesting that we need <laughs> RSVPTE as the technology to support their traffic engineering needs, right? Um, for once, uh, the FR options for recovery, um, the ability to set up through steering uh, alternative path for dual transmission, um, explicitly managed load splitting over alternative path or, you know, cost reductions through Steiner trees, which you also uh, would have a very hard time to do through an IGP. Last but not least, FRR. Um, so the FRR uh, that is BRTE specific at this point in time is very powerful, uh, but also to a to good degree complex. And we just added text to say that because of the fact that through the same route adjacencies that give us um, the you know similar functionality to segment routing, right? Like you know steer through some few hops in the network and everything in the middle you don't care about um, the same. Adjacencies also give us the ability to just leverage normal MPLS, FRR, right? So if we do MPLS encapsulation for BRTE, then a routed adjacency could simply be an MPLS protected adjacency, um, where with normal MPLS mechanism, you have set up a backup uh, link protection tunnel and et voila, um, uh, BRTE can use those adjacencies. And I think that's pretty much the uh, end of the update for version 01, which I'll out now. Um, so basically, just a few things that were on the mind uh, for for the next rounds. Um, but please uh, chime in on the list on anything else that, that you think should be done. That's it. Next slide. See? <laughs> questions. All right, questions in the content. This is this says yet to be adopted, right? As a working group item. Yeah, we could. We could right. So, call, yeah. Right. So. I want to get a sense of the room. Who's read the draft? Okay. Who thinks this should be adopted as a working group item? Who feels this is not in charter? Love it. All right. Looks good. We'll take it to the list. Same game. Two weeks. And then uh, give your yay and nay. Or yay or nay. But either way. Thanks.
We are on to 6 OAM. Thanks, Greg. Um, so as uh, in the previous meeting uh, presenting uh, BRPing, uh, we uh, promised to have uh, uh, extract the requirements and then complement them with some more. Uh, so we delivered on our promise. And here's this document. Uh, let's go. Next slide. Um, that's why we're doing it. And um, so the document just summarizes uh, what we talked about it and uh, what we got uh, feedback on the list uh, from. Uh, everyone who got interested in this uh, subject. And uh, one of the uh, main uh, specifics of beer is that it's uh, um, unicast. So that's why uh, you'll find in the list a lot of uh, stressed uh, unicast uh, OEM capabilities in, in, uh, as continuity uh, check as well as performance measurement. But at the same time, there could be uh, applications that are interested in uh, bi-directional OEM, and uh, we believe that uh, this tool set uh, tools has to be uh, uh, developed uh, as well. And so thus, we are marking these uh, requirements as a must. Whether somebody will uh, choose to use them or not, that will be uh, their decision. Okay, so uh, we can go next. Just, just shout uh, next slide. It's okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, uh, one of the things is that, uh, at least in our understanding, uh, in imagination, that uh, there will be no fragmentation uh, in the uh, beer domain. So thus, uh, we need to provide uh, uh, maximum uh, transmit unit uh, discovery. Uh, in addition to um, connective, uh, continuity check um, and performance measurement, so there are uh, fault management signals uh, could be developed. We just don't know uh, uh, to what extent, uh, but at least we think that uh, there will be something uh, creative and uh, thus we just mark it as a requirement. Next slide. Um, so obviously this is a zero zero version and uh, we'll be working on it and uh, um, appreciate any uh, input, suggestion, comments, questions. Uh, uh, at some point we definitely will ask for uh, work group adoption. As informational? Uh, yes, it will be informational. Okay. Um, it, okay, it will be informational. But uh, because that these are requirements, right? Usually, it's requirements docs. It's a working doc within the group. It may not live past that, but elements from it then will be taken into the other um, I think that uh, it sometimes has a value to preserve uh, the requirements because if you if we develop uh, protocols and solutions, then we can uh, map them to the requirements, pointing that these are motivated. Uh, and based on this requirement, so we are taking these requirements off. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely on your side there. I, I like having documented what they can come to the conclusion back without understanding why we've done what we've done, and we have to go back through that again. So that's a good point. Having that documented somewhere could help. Yeah. So who's read this draft? All right. All right. Of uh, those who've read, Think this is something worth adopting? Yeah, clear. This is a process doc. This is an important part of moving stuff forward. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm still remaining here because you're the next one. Next is on me too. Good. That was six and on to seven. Yeah, um, so uh, this is an update uh, to our presentation uh, in Dallas. And uh, next slide, please. 
And because it's updates, so it's much shorter because we don't want to uh, bore you with their um, explanation on how it works. Um, it's a uh, uh, ping trace route functionality in uh, beer encapsulation. Um, you can definitely find a lot of parallels with functionality uh, with uh, MPLS LSP ping, but uh, because MPLS LSP ping is specific to MPLS data plane, so we decided to decouple the functionality and make it more as a control protocol that can be put into any encapsulation, in this case, into uh, beer encapsulation. Uh, so what was updated? Uh, we specified the version. We specified two message types. Uh, we specified what the protocol meaning is. Next slide, please. And uh, then we clarified some procedures as uh, when they're transmitting a reply, receiving reply, uh, uh, and uh, transmitting echo request, and uh, receiving echo request, transmitting uh, echo reply, and receiving echo reply. Um, so uh, we extended on um, um, return codes, uh, the use cases when they're generated, what their interpretation could be. Uh, and uh, we'll definitely welcome Next slide, please. your comments and uh, we appreciate their working group consider adoption. Further questions? Nothing. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. That takes us to eight. MPLS ICMP for beer payload. Okay, um, so previously the beer ping draft uh, already talked about uh, beer trace routes. Uh, which basically use the same uh, GTR expiration principle that IP trace route use. Um, so so can, can we go to the next slide? Basically, a BFR uh, could uh, get a GTR expiration um, for a beer uh, pin packet, and then it will send a response back, back to the BFIR, and that's how trace route works. But there is one issue. Um, next, uh, can you click. The beer packet, um, it can be tunneled uh, ac across some nodes, for example, some intermediate routes which cannot support the uh, beer. In that case, uh, especially if the tunnel uses um, a uniform mode uh, for TTR uh, processing, then we will we'll have an issue because the tunnel ingress will copy the TTL from the payload and decrease it at every hop. So the, B, uh, the TTL expiration could happen on the tunnel uh, on a transit router, which does not support beer. At that time, the current behavior is that MPOS ICMP processing will simply drop that message. No, there is no indication at all. Next slide. So the proposal is that um, you can click but can you click? Uh, yeah. So I, this is, there is animation. So the uh, trans, uh, LSR, if it, it uh, experiences a TTR uh, expiration, um, then it could generate the ICP message uh, if it's the beer or packets. The, currently, that ICMP message is generated only for IPv4 and IPv6 pay payload. Now we're proposing that uh, we do that same for beer pay. The first payload is 0101, and we know it's a beer packet. And then we use the original label stack minus the innermost label, which is the beer label, to label switch it to the BFR that originated that beer label. That packet is addressed to a local host, 127.0.01 or colon colon one, because 
that ICMP message is not going to be processed by the sending router. It's going to be processed by the, by the BFR. Next. The BFR will take the collect some beer specific information and also the tunnel hub information on where the expiration happened and then send the, gen, uh, send the uh, beer ping echo uh, reply message back to the BFIR. That is to be documented separately, for example, in that uh, beer ping um, uh, draft. This particular draft is only about uh, how the MPOS uh, uh, processing works. Next slide. So we have uh, had some discussions on the mailing list. Uh, we believe this is a useful thing. Um, we want to make sure that uh, then we'll uh, bring this work either to the NPOS or, or stay here depending on how this arrangement is made. Questions on content we dive in the process? Yeah. Some quick clarification question. Go to the uh, picture. So uh, when the TTL expires, which TTL you're talking about? And uh, because you said tunnel, right? So right, the, the tunnel, uh, the, uh, that TTL expires. So the tunnel, not a beer TTL. Yeah. OK. Um, so it's only if the tunnel TTL expires. So what, what exactly the TTL you put on the tunnel? So in, in, in this diagram, um, BFR1 put, uh, put that, that beer packet into, into the tunnel. So when it put the packet into the tunnel, it copies the TTL from the beer payload and put it into the label for the tunnel itself. And then when the, when the packet gets to the non-BFR1, at that time, the TL could, could expire. Because the context of the tunnel is not on the BFR, that non-BFR1, right? So if it expires, what does it do with the packet? The, the non-BFR1, it, it will generate the ICMP message. Basically, just copy the, as much as information from the, from the beer packets. But uh, my question is, how does it know that this is particular thing? So you're supposed to drop the packet, right? We're, we're, we're proposing that the MPOS processing, realizing that this is a beer packet, and then you will just, uh, instead of dropping it, you will uh, generate the ICMP message. Oh, or that's... You, uh, you will drop the packet, but in, in the meantime, you generate the ICMP message and send it to the, to the BFR. So this is only applicable for beer, or because even in the pseudo wire case, it, it just drops the packet. So well, how does it's going to change from? How does it know that it has to do for this versus the other? Well, um, just like in the IPv4 and IPv6 case, you you notice the first nibble is IP4 or six, you know, and then you you know that it's IPv4 or IPv6, you generate ICP message. Now we're just extending that a little bit to say that. Oh, if that we realize this is a beer packet, it will do the same as well. Um, Jeffrey. Um, so, um, uh, Greg Mirsky, Eric Sainz. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, so, their beer uh, packet doesn't have any uh, IP information. Right. Okay. So, how, uh, where this ICMV packet will be sent? As it's addressed to the, the, the destination uh, address of that ICMP is 127.0.0.1 or colloquial.1. And then we use, we label switch it to, to that the BFR, BFR2 in that in in picture. Uh, but how do we know that there is a, uh, because LSP is unidirectional. Right. Right. Yeah. So, how do we know that we have MPLS path to this uh, gateway to there, reach it? Because it's not given. Well, it's, you just you that 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 packet that just had a, a TTR expiration has a, a label stack in it. 
We just use that label stack. But the label stack is what remains it. We don't know where, where it came from. There is no source label. We, no, no, no. We, 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 do not, we do not send it back to the PFIR. We send it to that. You can see that uh, in that picture. Where is PFR1? But that, th this information is nowhere. We are talking about the tunnel. The tunnel BF, B, B, between BFR1 no, but and we BFR2. don't have a That's information. We don't know. Just maybe are you talking about the destination? The, the, the BFR ID is in the packet. Well, it's, we need to know where it came from. Well, we, we, uh, so, we, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how useful it is to operator to know. Okay, packet from somewhere got TTL expiration. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what TTL was there. What, what, which router are you talking? I do you know, are you saying that BFR two? No, because know. okay. So no. basically, what you're suggesting is that instead of forwarding original packet, we are forwarding ICMP TTL expire to the end of the tunnel. Yes. Okay. So So what the end of, the end of time is BFR2. He understand the, understand the beer. He look at the beer packet, in, which is in, in, is part of the ICMP message. He, he, from there, he knows the BFIR. Yeah. Then he will send that the response is, will be sent to the BF, uh, BFIR. Earlier wise, that means that you need to have another tunnel to send it there. No, IP you can IP route it back there. Just, See, in this in this in this picture yeah, uh, well BFR that two. again that not necessarily that you have IP connectivity between two beer for uh, beer domains in the in in the beer ping uh, drafts you added the option for to, to, to send the beer beer ping uh, uh, echo reply to the BFIR right uh, well again is that it's, 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 it's it, seems, it seems to me that there are a lot of assumptions, um, or I, or or prerequisites to operator how to set up uh, this environment in order to uh, get any useful uh, any use of this proposal. I I think I think there may be some disconnection between you and me that uh, is causing this. Okay. Yeah. We yeah, can we, we, we can, can sort it out. Okay. Yeah. All right, moving on to process. Uh, again, this is not a working group item currently. Uh, uh, yeah, we want to, right. to get the like, discussion going, and yeah. then if the working group thinks this is worth, worth pursuing, then yeah. either here or in NPOS. So, so independent of the content, what we have precedence so far is solidify the technology here, yeah. then take it off to the actually appropriate working group for just collaboration, and okay. we'll decide where it moves on from there. But it sounds like there's some discussion needs to take place. So let's do that. Let's bring it out to the list, get that going, and then we can talk about an adoption vote. Yes. Thank you. I'm not too late. I mean, I, I, I like the idea, but I, I'm also worried about that problem, right? So basically figuring out a mechanism that always works to send back information to whoever the, you know, guys that should get it, BFIR or so. So it would be good to, to, to clear that up. But the BFIR... BFR IR is part of the packet of the, the beer encoding, so the information is in there yeah. always. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. so bear with me a second. Uh, there's a missing presentation that apparently got mailed to me at the last minute, so I'm diving into email and find it. So talk to yourself for a few minutes. Can you do that? <laughs> Found it. All right. So this is a the of the streets route. 
you're measuring delayed all the way through. But when that, whatever happens, to, to begin with, the OEM puts it back. It's back. It's close. You're on. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zhang from RTE. Uh, this draft about young data model for beer. Yes. Next, please. Yeah, let's bring them back together. We have projector failure. We may have like an old middle school AV expert in the room. Maybe. <laughs> hey, look at that. Okay. That's the magic question. How many IETF engineers does it take to run a projector? Three. Um, this First slide was the intro slide. There we go. All right. This, docu this document defines the, uh, the, uh, the young data model for beer. Uh, next, please. Um, uh, this module augments uh, routine instance. Uh, sorry. <laughs> And uh, uh, with 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 beer containers, uh, the beer containers contains uh, the beer uh, contains uh, defines uh, all the defines all the topology. Uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, the beer containers defines all the com configuration uh, parameters related to the uh, to the beer. The beer config uh, configurations contains uh, the global routing uh, instance configurations and the parameter uh, and the interface uh, configurations. Uh, the global uh, routing instance configur uh, configurations uh, includes. Uh, the tra transport type, address family, um, and uh, multi topology. Uh, yes, next please. Um, control play, uh, control play configuration. Uh, this module aug aug augment uh, routine protocols. Uh, it, uh, it supports exists and OSPF as control play um, for beer. That y yes next operational state structure uh, it defines uh, multi uh, multi topology identifier uh, sub domain uh, and other informations uh, such as uh, bit index routing table and uh, bit index uh, forward table yes next notifications. Uh, it, uh, in this draft, it defines three notifications, uh, BFR identifier collision, uh, BFR zero, and uh, subdomain identifier collision. Yes, uh, next, please. Uh, comments, we are. Yes, that's all. We have any self proclaimed Yang experts in the room? Wow. Okay. Are you working with uh, some of the other Yang people within the IETF? So we were in line with. Where are you going? Are you working with the other Yang experts within the IETF so that we keep ourselves in line? The trouble is, I, I I can't contribute one way or the other about whether this is you know the right architecture. So. Torres? So yeah. It, it, at the off chance that you're calling me later with what I'm suggesting, but uh, you know, I think we all want the Yang, and we are all the experts. No, right? So, um, <laughs> can the working group chair try to find us a shepherd from outside yeah, to help? Good point. Okay. Okay. And and by the way, you know, I mean, I you, you saw my remark, right? I'd I'd be happy if I don't have to do the Yang stuff, which is why I, I love to be able to just stick to CLI, but obviously um, to to, to be full solution, I want the Yang also for the beer TE. So if I can ever explain to you the TE stuff, then maybe you'll find some cycles to add that as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Questions? Comments? That was fast. 
That was our last Prezo. I mean, we had eight stacked up, and I was hoping to have a little more dynamic, but it actually was the first one had the most, most talk. I think our, our biggest action item from here is uh, focusing on a design team, uh, potentially even an interim meeting, I think, to, to nail down the redundant issues, ingress and egress. So um, just as kind of show of hands, who would be interested in a, an interim meeting just to focus on those architecture issues? You're not going to raise your hand? OK, because I, I, I know who I think should be there, right? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> OK, excellent. So we'll take that to the list. We'll get some volunteer names out there. We'll start throwing around dates and locations and see if we can get that nailed down. Because sometimes in the email, it takes more more than just the, the, the ping. So blues, everyone sign a blue? If you have not signed a blue, please come up and do so. You have two to choose from. Pick one. All right. And thank you for coming. Have a great week. That's for one part. Thank you very much. And honestly, some of those things I need to dive in. I, I just want to know we've got the right experts in the room saying they check. Oh, very good. You were involved in the book. Good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a list of, of documents on the and I'll just individually make a request. Yes, yeah, on my list. Yeah, I took it to the room. I'm, I'm trying to see what the sentiment is right now. <laughs> Don't hand it to me.